want to start by asking you guys a question. How many of you have had to fill out some sort of web form where you've been asked to read a distorted sequence of characters like this one? Excellent. How many of you found it really annoying? Excellent. Well, I invented that. Uh, uh, that thing is called a CAPTCHA, and the reason is there is to make sure that you, the entity filling out the form, are actually a human and not a computer program that was written to submit the form millions of times. And the reason it works is because humans can read these distorted characters, whereas computer programs can't do it as well yet. So for example, in the case of Ticketmaster, the reason you have to type these is to make sure that ticket scalpers cannot write a program to, that can buy millions of tickets kind of two at a time. Now, uh, at some point, uh, I, I realized that this was used by every single website in the world, essentially. And I did a little back of the envelope calculation to figure out how many times one of these was typed every day by people around the world. And it turns out that number is about 200 million. So about 200 million times a day, somebody types one of these. Now, when I first heard this, I was quite proud of myself. I thought, look at the impact that my work has had. Uh, but then I started feeling bad, because not only does everybody find them annoying, but also, each time you do one of these, you waste about 10 seconds of your time. And if you multiply 10 seconds by 200 million, you get that humanity as a whole is wasting about 500,000 hours every day typing these annoying CAPTCHAs because of me. Uh, so I started feeling bad. Um, and then I started thinking, is there any way in which we can use this effort for something that is good for humanity? And the answer was yes, and this is what we're doing now. So what you may not know is that nowadays, while you type a CAPTCHA, not only are you authenticating yourself as a human, but also you're helping us to digitize books. So let me explain how that works. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there trying to digitize books. Uh, for example, Google's trying to digitize all of the books in the world. And the way it works is you start with a physical book, and, now, and then you scan it. Now, scanning a book literally consists of taking a digital photograph of every page of the book. The next step in the process is that the computer needs to be able to decipher all of the words that are in these pictures of pages. Uh, now, the problem is that for older books where the ink has faded, the computer cannot recognize many of the words. So what we're doing now is we decided to take all of the words that the computer cannot recognize in the book digitization process, and we started getting people to read them for us while they type a CAPTCHA on the internet. Okay, so next time you type a CAPTCHA, one of these words, these words are actually words that are coming from books that are being digitized that the computer could not recognize, and we're getting people to read them for, for us while they type the CAPTCHA. Now, this is, uh, th this, this is my previous project. Thank you. Uh, uh, so this is, this is my previous project. Um, and in about 2011, I had just sold this company. This happened to be a company that helped digitize books. I had just sold it to Google. And I, uh, that was my second company that I had sold to Google. And I decided that at that point that I wanted to work on something that was related to my passion which is education. Uh, and this is when I started my next project called Duolingo. Uh, now, my, my views on education have always been um, very influenced by where I'm from. It turns out I am from Guatemala. This is a public service announcement. That is where Guatemala is. Uh, and by the way, that is not where they keep the prisoners. That's called Guantanamo. <laughs> That's not the same. Uh, now, Guatemala is a very poor country. And a lot of people talk about uh, education as being something that brings equality to different social classes. But I always saw it as the complete opposite. I always saw it as something that brings inequality to social classes. Because what happens in practice is that people who have a lot of money can buy themselves the best education in the world. And because they are so well education, educated, they remain having a lot of money. Whereas people who don't have very much money barely learn how to read and write. And because of that, they remain not having a lot of money. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to create something related to education that would give equal access to education to everybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status. This is what I wanted to do. Now, uh, education is very general, so I decided to concentrate on one type of education, um, which happens to be very big around the world, which is learning a foreign language. There is about 1.2 billion people in the world learning a foreign language. Now, this number, th this market is pretty interesting. The majority of these people, 800 million of them, satisfy three properties. First, they're learning English. Second, the reason they're learning English is in order to get a job or a better job. And third, they are of low socioeconomic conditions. Okay, so most people that are learning a foreign language in the world are basically people who are trying to get out of poverty by learning English. Now, before we started Duolingo, uh, most of the ways there were to learn a language were very expensive, especially with software. For example, in the United States, there's a program called the Rosetta Stone, which costs between $500 and $1,000. Uh, in some countries outside of the US, there is a program called uh, Open English, which costs about $1,000. So this was the irony. Uh, it seemed most people that were trying to learn a foreign language were trying to do so to get out of poverty, but in order to get out of poverty, they needed $1,000. Uh, 
this just made no sense. So what we decided with me and my co-founder, my co-founder, uh, Severin Hacker, what we decided is that we were going to create a way to learn languages that was going to be 100% free. And that is what we did with Duolingo. So we launched Duolingo. Uh, thank you. So ab about three and a half years ago, we launched Duolingo. And since then, Duolingo has become the most popular way to learn languages in the world. Uh, today, we have about 110 million users. Uh, there are a, a, a bunch of funny statistics. For example, there are more people learning languages on Duolingo in the United States than there are people learning languages in the whole US public school system. Uh, another interesting thing, um, we, we teach a lot of different languages. We teach English, Spanish, German, etc. But we also teach some of smaller languages. For example, we teach Irish. Uh, I actually did not realize that Irish was a language. I thought they spoke English in Ireland, but it turns out they also speak Irish. Uh, turns out I, there are 94,000 native speakers of Irish. On Duolingo, there are about 1 million people learning Irish. So we have, we have the potential to actually multiply the number of speakers of Irish by 10. Now, what's to me, what, what makes me the, the proudest is the following. We have, we have entire countries that have essentially signed an agreement with us where their whole public school system is using Duolingo to learn a language. And most of these are developing countries. So for example, Colombia, Costa Rica, some parts of Brazil, they are using Duolingo in their public schools to teach English mainly. So now, if you, are, if you go to a public school in one of these developing countries, uh, usually you do not have very much money because the public school system is just not very good. So if you have any amount of money, you usually send your kids to a private school. So on one end of the spectrum, we have children from, you know, poor children from developing countries using Duolingo to learn a language. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, in a re recent Reddit AMA, Bill Gates said that he uses Duolingo to learn a language. So to me, that is what makes me uh, the proudest, the fact that the richest man in the world and people from public schools in developing countries are using the exact same method to learn a language. Thank you. That means that more money cannot buy you a better education. And this is exactly what we wanted to do. And this is what we're doing with Duolingo. Now, uh, this is an interesting graph. If, if you're familiar with Rosetta Stone, this was the main way to learn languages in the United States. This is the, the number of Google searches for du Rosetta Stone versus Duolingo. The reason I like to show this is because Rosetta Stone spends about $200 million a year on advertisement, whereas with Duolingo, we have never spent a single cent on advertisement. It's all through word of mouth. And so, so now, some of the things that people say about Duolingo are very positive. So for example, this person said they learn most, more from Duolingo than in, in two days from Duolingo than in four years of high school. Now, that doesn't say that much about Duolingo. That says more about the high school system in the United States. Um, or this other person, who was my mother. <laughs> now, uh, you know, one of the reasons why Duolingo is so popular is because we, we realized early on that learning anything by yourself is really difficult. Keeping yourself motivated is really difficult. So we decided to make Duolingo feel like you're playing a game. So when you're using Duolingo, uh, the idea is that it should be fun. It should be something that you want to continue doing. So for example, this is what Duolingo looks like for, uh, on iPhones. And by the way, Duolingo is available on iPhones, Android, Windows Phone. Don't laugh about Windows Phone. Windows Phone uh, and, and uh, the web at Duolingo.com. Now, this is, this is what the, the main screen of Duolingo looks like on iPhones. Uh, the whole thing looks a little bit like a game. So the way you learn a language is we've split up languages into multiple units that we call skills. So for example, food is a skill. That's where you learn how to order food. Or animals is a skill. That's where you learn all the different names of animals, etc. And the idea is that at the beginning, only one of these units is unlocked. And you have to complete it to unlock other units. So you're slowly unlocking the language. Feels a lot like you're playing a game. And in each of these units, you get very simple five-minute lessons where in the lesson, it feels like you're playing a mini game. And you're always engaged. You're not reading grammar rules or anything. You're just always engaged. So for example, in some of the exercises, you have to translate something. So in this case, you, you would, on the left, you'd be learning how to say, what would you like to eat in Spanish? Or you have to click on the right picture related to the dog. Or you may have to say something to the app, and it tells you whether you said it correctly or not. And the idea is for each of these exercises, every single exercise on Duolingo is teaching you something, but you can always get it right or wrong. We always expect an answer from you to make sure that you're motivated. And if you get something right, this top bar goes up. And if you get something wrong, that top bar goes down. And the idea is that the, is at the beginning of a lesson, the top bar is empty, and you have to fill up the, the, the top bar, the, the progress bar, to, to complete the lesson. 
Now, this bar may seem very simplistic, but it's actually very sophisticated, and we've tested a lot to how to make this bar more sophisticated and, and better for engagement. So for example, if the exercise that you get is a difficult exercise, the bar goes up more than if it was a simple exercise uh, and when you get it correct. Uh, but if the exercise is difficult and you get it wrong, the bar doesn't go down very much because anyways, we kind of expected you to get it wrong. Okay, so the idea is that we've actually tested this bar a lot to try to keep you more motivated. And in fact, every single part of the user interface we've, we've A-B tested to make sure that people are more motivated. So for example, uh, we made this change of the user interface. I'm going to highlight it. So it used to be that our top bar was like the left, and it is now uh, what you see on the right. It used to be the case that each lesson contained 20 exercises. And you had to complete 20 exercises, but you had these three hearts. And whenever you got an exercise wrong, you would lose a heart. And if you lost all three hearts, you had to start over. That's what it used to be like. Now, we have this progress bar that goes up and down. When we made the change going from the hearts to the progress bar that goes up and down, we, we saw that people were engaged about 5% more. So they learned about 5% more. And this is the type of thing that we do all the time to try to keep Duolingo as engaging as possible. Now, when we started Duolingo, it's a funny thing. Uh, I didn't know anything about how to teach languages. I'm not a native English speaker. I learned English at a at an early age, so I had to learn another language, but I didn't know anything about how to teach languages. Neither did my co-founder. So what we did is we started reading a bunch of books on how to best teach languages. So we literally read French for Dummies, and we read a bunch of other books. At some point, we found one that seemed really great. It was called something like the best method to learn a language. And we read it, and it had a lot of scientific evidence supporting that this was actually the best method to learn a language. So we thought, oh, great, we're done. Now we just have to take this method and make an app out of it, and we'll have the best app to teach languages in the world. Uh, unfortunately, we found another book that was also called The Best Method to Learn a Language that was completely contradictory to the first one. And so we got confused. Uh, and then we started realizing that we kept on finding more and more books that completely contradicted each other. And we realized that basically nobody knew what the best method was to learn a language. Uh, and we had very simple questions. I mean, we were engineers trying to build a language learning system, so we, we wanted to know things like, should we teach plurals before adjectives or adjectives before plurals? This is what we wanted to know, and nobody could tell us the answer. And we even met with uh, very uh, you know, well-known experts in foreign language education, and they wouldn't be able to tell us the answer. So what we did is we took what we could out of these books, and then we launched. Now, after we launched, fortunately, we started getting a lot of traffic, and we realized that we were in a unique opportunity which was that for once, we could actually figure out the answer to all of our questions with our own users. So for example, nowadays, if we want to figure out whether we should teach plurals before adjectives or adjectives before plurals, we just do an experiment with our own users. And we can do a very large scale experiment. So for example, we can say for the next 50,000 people that signed up, to half of them, we're going to teach them plurals before adjectives. The other half, we're going to teach them adjectives before plurals. And then we're going to measure which ones learn better and which ones stick around for longer, which ones make like, less mistakes, et cetera. And we can figure out once and for all whether it's better to teach adjectives before plurals or plurals before adjectives. And we're doing this every single day. So every day, literally every day, Duolingo is getting better because we are running different tests on how to best teach a language. And because of that, Duolingo has become very uh, effective. So for example, somebody from the City University of New York did a study to figure out how well you can learn on Duolingo. And they found that if you use Duolingo for 34 hours, you learn the equivalent of a one semester university course in that language, uh, which is usually takes a lot longer than 34 hours. Uh, now, our, our biggest, one of our biggest things that we believe is that education should be in your pocket and not in some building. One of the reasons is because it allows us to reach more people. This is why Duolingo has been able to reach this many people. But not just education. Another thing that, we st that we've recently uh, launched is a, a, new, um, a, a new initiative that we launched that's called the Duolingo Test Center. Uh, the idea is the following. We started getting a lot of emails about a, a year ago, or no, a couple of years ago. We started getting a lot of emails from people telling us, thank you for teaching me English. Uh, I wasn't able to learn English before this, but now I am able to afford it. But now I have a problem, which is that I need to be able to have a certificate that says that I know English, because I'm trying to apply to university, or my job requires it, et cetera. Uh, and we started getting a lot of these emails, and then we decided to look into the English language certification business. And what we found was crazy. So it turns out about $10 billion a year are spent on people certifying that they know English. And most of this money is spent by taking standardized tests that most of you have probably heard of. For example, the TOEFL is one of them, or the IELTS is another one. And the idea is that the way you certify that you know English, if you need to certify that for your job or whatever, you have to take this test that costs about $200. 
You have to go to a testing center, which is a physical testing center. You have to go, and the whole process takes about eight weeks. Now, for people in the United States, this seems annoying. $200, you have to go somewhere, and it takes about eight weeks. But for people in countries like India, this is more than annoying. $200 is a lot of money. Also, testing centers, they're not in every single city, so you may have to travel. Uh, so what we decided is we were going to do something a lot better. So we launched an app called the Duolingo Test Center, where the idea is that from this app, you can take a, 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 an English language certification test for only $20, not $200, and you can take it from the app. Now, uh, for this, we had to create, solve three problems. The first is we had to create a test that was as accurate as the TOEFL at figuring out whether you know English or not. That turned out to be the easiest part. That was easy. Second, we had to make sure that when people take this test, they don't cheat. Because you see, that's the reason why you have to go to a testing center to make sure that you are you. Um, so uh, what we did is when, when you take a test from the app, we actually turn on the front facing camera and the microphone and we record you taking the test. And then a real human watches you take the test to make sure that you didn't cheat. That's the second problem. We've solved it. The third problem, and that's we're in the process of solving it, is we need to make sure that this test is recognized by a lot of institutions throughout the world. And this is what we're doing. And we are, uh, I'm happy to say that we have, we're working with the 12 top universities in the United States. And in, hopefully in the next admission cycle, they're going to be accepting both our test and the TOEFL. And that'll be great. And if anything, if the only thing we're able to achieve is that the TOEFL lowers their price to $20, that'll be a win for us. And that's all, uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.